Decision for Life. Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. How many of you have ever watched uh, Back to the Future, that movie with Michael J. Fox? I think it was two or three of them. How many of you have ever watched that, you know? The premise is he's got this DeLorean that's been converted into time travel, you know, and they go back and forth in time. And uh, Marty McFly was getting ready to take off. And old Doc Brown looks at him and he says, Marty, whatever you do, stay away from 2020. I think that's probably good advice, don't you? How many of you would agree with me, life is not easy? How many of you would say, Pastor, life can be very difficult, and as a matter of fact, is very difficult uh, right now? Well, here's the deal. We don't live in heaven. We live on earth. And as long as we are living here in this world, we're going to be disappointed. We're going to have heartaches. There's going to be difficulties. There's going to be sorrows and heartaches and pain. Uh, no wonder we are taught to pray, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, we want things to be down here like we know that it is going to be up there. But as long as we are here, we're going to face all of that stuff. Thank God when we get to heaven, there'll be no more of that. Uh, it'll be a life of peace. Now, if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to the book of Matthew, the fifth chapter, Matthew chapter number five. You say, well, pastor, that's where we were last Sunday. Well, whoopee, we're going to be there next Sunday too, okay? And uh, I, I will tell you, uh, I argued with God about today's message. I very rarely ever do that. Um, because I wanted to preach what I know I'm going to preach next Sunday. I wanted to preach it this Sunday, and he said, no, I want this this Sunday. And uh, so with uh, great trepidation, we jump in here today and just uh, see what God is going to say to us from Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 4. If you are there in the Word, say amen. Good deal. Here we go. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now, isn't that about as silly a statement as you could ever imagine? Is it? Does that not sound ludicrous to anybody here in the room? Uh, I mean, how in the world? Now, if you put it in kind of a paraphrase, happy are those who are sad. Does that make sense to anybody in the house? But that's exactly what the Holy Spirit is saying to us here, blessed are those that mourn for they shall be comforted. Now some of you are here today and everything's just kind of going smooth for you. It, it's uh, no bumps in the road. Uh, it's all just smooth as glass and you're not having any problems and life is easy for you right now. But there are others of you like the guy who called me yesterday before I left the house to come to worship last night and he said, Pastor, I just want you to know I lost my job yesterday. Uh, also, Pastor, my wife uh, is unemployed because what she was doing has played out and there was no more uh, for her to do. So we are both now unemployed. Maybe uh, your boyfriend has just broken up with you or your girlfriend has just dumped you along the wayside. Uh, maybe you're in a health storm. I, I don't know what you may be facing, you may be like us and you have had the death of a loved one that has occurred, but the fact of the matter is many of you here are facing a tremendous amount of grief and you're navigating that. I, I, I've got a couple of things I want to say to you before I get really started into the message that, that I think may be helpful to all of us. One is um, God never intends for us to always be happy. Are you aware of that? Uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 3 uh, gives us the indication. He said there is a time to laugh and there is a time to mourn. So it's never been God's intention for us to 
be walking in a clover field, picking up flowers and singing kumbaya all of our life. That's just not the plan of God. There is a time to mourn. Also, uh, I'll share with you that the Word of God says that we are to mourn over our sin. When we see things that uh, and do things in our life that uh, is displeasing unto God, God says, I want you to mourn over that. You ought to grieve over uh, the sin of your life. And then, of course, he says that we are to mourn over the lostness uh, of our friends. So it's never God's intention for us to always be happy. The second thing I want to share with you today is that grief really is a very healthy experience. It's good for you psychologically, emotionally, and spiritually, and physically. It's good for us uh, to experience grief and to mourn the loss or the disappointments in this life. It is extremely unhealthy to repress or to block out those events out of our minds and our hearts or to suppress it and just to push it back down and act like that it never happened or we don't even want to allow ourselves to think about it. God doesn't want us to repress or suppress. God wants us to confess our grief and also to express our grief. It's healthy to do so. Now some of you are here today as in the other two services, many. And there's been something that has happened to you in your past. Uh, maybe even years ago. Some disappointment, some heartache, some pain that you experienced, some loss, some disappointment, maybe even something that you perceive to be shameful and you've really never dealt with it and you have repressed it and suppressed it all of these years. Let me tell you what the Bible says about that. You ready? In, in Psalm 32, the Bible says, David the psalmist says, when I kept things to myself, I felt weak deep inside me. I moaned all day long. And then he said in Psalm 39, he says, I was silent and held my peace to no avail. My distress only grew worse. So understand something. If you don't manage the grief, the grief is going to manage you. Uh, if you don't learn how to grieve helpfully, then it's only going to get worse according to the Word of God. Now understand something. Uh, the creation of that grief really is not our choice. What produces the grief is not something that we have the opportunity to choose. But I want to tell you what we do have the opportunity to choose, and that is how to deal with the grief now that we have it. Uh, so seek God about this thing. Now, many of you may say, well, Pastor, you know, we know what's happened in your life, and uh, you and Kathy have suffered the loss of a great young man, and it's only been a short few weeks ago since you have had to go, don't you think it's a little bit too early for you to be handling some of this? But I, I, I have to tell you how God is healing my broken heart and how God is healing my wife's broken heart and our family's broken heart from the Word of God with the purpose that maybe God could touch somebody else in the process of that. So let's dig in for a few minutes and share how God's helping. You ready? Got a pen? They all begin with P, so it's easy to remember. Uh, God is helping heal our broken heart with his presence. He pulls us up to himself. Uh, the Bible says in Psalm 34, 18, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and he saves those whose spirits have been crushed. I don't know how many of you have listened to the homegoing service or not or how many of you were here. You heard me make a statement in the midst of that that right now it seems like God is millions of miles away. Have you ever been there? Have you been in the midst of a hurt and a disappointment and, and something that was just totally unexpected that just cut you to the bone and it just seemed like God was nowhere around? I want to, I want to tell you, something that we have uh, always known 
and that God is reminding us afresh and anew in these days. You ready? What you feel is not real. What you feel is not real. You say, how do you know that? Because God's word is very clear. And he tells us in the book of Hebrews, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. And we're discovering in the process of our grief that God is closer than he's ever been before in our life. How can he not be when he says, I am close to the brokenhearted and to those whose hearts have been crushed. So God's never more near than he is right now. Some of you through the midst of your greatest failures in life and you think, God, you're nowhere around. No, he's right there. Uh, some of those things that created the grace, greatest shame of your life and you feel like, God, how, how could you possibly be here uh, when I'm going through this much stuff? And God says, I, I've never left and I'm drawing near to you because you are so broken hearted. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 10, the Bible says Paul is writing to the church at Corinth and he says, our hearts ache, but at the same time, we have the joy of the Lord. So we're discovering in the midst of this, God's wonderful presence. Let me give you a second his position. Have you ever thought, think on this for just a minute. Have you ever thought that we serve an emotional God? Have you ever thought about that? We serve an emotional God. That God weeps with us. That God weeps over us. Uh, I, I love the passage in Isaiah 53, 3, uh, when it is giving a wonderful description of the Lord Jesus, God in the flesh. And the Bible says he is acquainted with our grief we, we, we serve an emotional God I, one of my favorite uh, New Testament accounts of the Lord is in John chapter 11 when he shows up uh, when Jesus shows up in Bethany and uh, th there Mary and Martha were grieving the loss of their brother and they were weeping so profoundly that Jesus looked at them and, and the Bible says that he was moved with compassion and there is recorded the shortest verse of all of the Bible Jesus wept think with me about that a minute he's acquainted with our grief he's touched by our grief he is moved with our grief he is in the position where he experiences the same grief and emotions that we face as well I don't know about you, but that sure does encourage me that God knows how I feel and that God is moved in compassion. Now, yet, some of you old boys sitting out there thinking, well, you know, uh, I, I don't, I'm not one of these emotional kind of guys and I, I don't cry. I think it's really a sign of weakness. And if you're going to be a macho man, if you're going to be a man of strength, then you don't need to be crying and, and just dry. We, we're taught that from a very early age. Do you remember when your dad and mom beat the fire out of you and, and the water was just pouring out of your eyes? Shut that crying up. Hmm? Y'all remember? Shake your head like that. I'm sure you do. So we're taught very early that crying is not cool. But may I remind you that the strongest man who's ever walked on this earth was acquainted with our grief and he wept. His presence, Isaiah 61, he has sent me to comfort all who mourn, to give to those who mourn in Zion joy and gladness instead of grief and a song of praise instead of sorrow. He pulls himself up to us. He positions himself to us. I feel your pain, I feel your grief, I feel your rejection. Let me give you number three. And this really puts a smile on my face. And that is his people. His people. In Romans chapter 12, there are three verses in there that I just kind of want to lay out there for you. And uh, I hope that you'll be blessed by them. It's uh, 
chapter 12, verse 5, 10, and 12. And the Bible, 5, 10, and 15, the Bible says in these three verses, in Christ, we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. Be devoted to each other like a loving family. Rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. Hey, come here just a minute. I want to tell you something. God never intended for you to live your life alone. God never intended for you to live your life isolated and aloof. That's why you're in this body of Christ together. I loved Adrian Rogers and I miss him and I miss the influence that he had among the body of Christ. And he made this amazing statement. He says that we as the body of Christ we are to multiply each other's joys and we are to divide each other's sorrows. That's what it means to be a part of the family of God. That's what it means to be a part of the body of Christ. Healing comes through the body of Christ, his church. That's why I have been so adamantly opposed to shutting down churches uh, across this country. It's why I've been so adamantly opposed to, to isolating the body of Christ because the fact of the matter is we need each other and we're much stronger together than we ever are apart from one another. And I'm grateful to God that he's brought us back so that we can worship together. By the way, this, uh, this, this passage of scripture is not optional to us as believers. It's part of being the family of God that we are to be devoted to each other. It, it, I don't understand sometimes when somebody has a major victory how somebody can be jealous about it. As a part of the body of Christ, if somebody is successful, then we're to rejoice with them. If they have a major failure, we're not to gloat over that. We're to rally around them and uplift them and encourage them in the Lord and bear their burden. Kathy and I absolutely would not have made it this far without the body of Christ. I can't tell you the numbers of hours that we have sat and read the cards and felt your prayers, enjoyed the phone calls, enjoyed the handshakes and the hugs from the body of the Lord. The Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5, 11, comfort each other and strengthen one another. Here's what I know. It's not speculation. There are two kinds of people that are listening to me today right here in this room and listening through live stream and also on the television. There are two kinds of people. There are those that are going through major difficulties in their life and they're experiencing heart-wrenching grief right now that need someone to come alongside them, put an arm around them, and love them through that experience. There's a second group of people. You're not experiencing grief right now, and life's going pretty good for you. You need to go comfort those that are needing comfort. You've been where they are you know how that feels. You know what they're experiencing. God brought you through it and now he intends to use you to comfort others. Got some advice for you though. When you seek to go comfort somebody, don't be too aggressive about trying to get them to get over it. Because the fact of the matter is, ladies and gentlemen, we're not going to get over it. Just help us get through it. Let me give you number four and his plan. Realizing his plan. Now, I want to I make this statement because I don't believe it was in the plan of God whatsoever for my grandson to die at 21 years old. But I do believe that now that has happened, God has a plan for our grief. God wants to use our grief. C.S. Lewis made this statement. 
He says, God whispers to us in our prosperity and he shouts to us in the midst of our pain. I, I believe there are three things that probably I'm, I'm figuring out here as I walk with God. One is, is that this grief oftentimes can shake us out of our lethargy and get us ready to be changed in some area of our life that needs to be changed that we would have never changed at all had the circumstance not evolved. The second thing that I know in my heart is Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good to those who love the Lord, to those who are called according to his purpose. It didn't say all things are good. It said all things work together for good. It didn't say all things work together for good for all people. He said only to those that love me and to those that I've called to be a part of my family. The third thing that I know that God uses our grief in is that grief is used oftentimes to get us ready for eternity, to prepare us for ahead. I want you to listen to one of the most powerful things Paul ever wrote in the scriptures. He says, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes known what, not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Kathy, I know that you remember very, very well September the 1st, 1971. We woke up early that morning about 6.30, 6 o'clock. Kathy says, it's time. I said, are you sure? It's six o'clock. It's time. So we jump in the car and we go to St. Francis Hospital. And back in the days when uh, they didn't allow dads to be in the birthing rooms, they stuck her in a room at the end of the hall, put me at the other end of the hall and put up a screen so I couldn't even see down the hall. I was there for a little while and all of a sudden I heard a shrill come from the vocal cords of my wife that put chills all over me. And I'll just tell you this, uh, your pastor broke rules that day. I went to her side. Kathy was writhing in pain. Very difficult childbirth. Screamed to the top of her lungs. But I'll never forget the look on her face when they took that little baby boy and they laid him in her arms and all of a sudden she never remembered the pain anymore. You see, it's very easy if we're not careful to keep focusing in on the pain. But God says there's a major award, reward waiting and I want you to focus in on that which is not seen. Don't focus in on what you see Look ahead to what you have not seen, for I have not seen, ear hath not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for us. Keep looking ahead. Let me give you number five. You ready? It's God's promise. God's promise. First Thessalonians 4, the Bible tells us that one of these days, the dead in Christ are going to rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. I have a promise from God that I'm going to see my grandson again one of these days. I have a promise from God that says there's going to be a reunion day coming. I have a promise from God that says... Wherefore, we will ever be with the Lord. I have a promise from God that we will never be separated ever again. That's his promise. You say, well, preacher, let me ask you a question. Why do Christians grieve then if you're going to spend eternity in heaven with your loved ones that have gone on? Why do Christians grieve then if you're going to be reunited? Good question. 
I'm not grieving because of where Cameron is. I'm not grieving for him at all. Let me tell you why. Um, Cameron had a wonderful testimony of his love for Jesus. He didn't always do what was right. He had a craving. He had an addiction. He had a sickness of drug addiction that he wrestled with all of the time. And um, getting ready to go to a rehab center, and he said, now, Pop, I want to tell you something. If they get to talking to me about a hole in my heart, I'm probably going to leave. I don't have a hole in my heart. I'm very comfortable with my relationship to Jesus Christ. I know that when I die, I am going to heaven. I know him personally. And he described to me on two different occasions his relationship with the Lord Jesus. I came away with a good biblical understanding that my grandson had truly experienced what it means to be saved. He said, I, I don't want them to talk to me about a hole in my heart. I don't have a hole in my heart. I want to know why I do what I do. And I can just say to you today, I'm not grieving because of where Cameron is because he today has experienced and is experiencing the peace that he yearned for his entire life life. He is in heaven today experiencing all of the joys. I'm not grieving him. I'm grieving me because we miss him so much. You understand something, that the test of my faith does not come through some virus and pandemic. The test of my belief system is not how to handle the parties of this life. The test of my belief system and the test of my faith comes through the deaths of this life. You know, the world doesn't understand that kind of grief. They don't know how to handle it. But let me share with you what God's word says. In Revelation chapter 21, that there's gonna come a day that God will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the former things have all passed away. You know, the world doesn't get that. The world doesn't understand that. Now, I want to I wanna close with the last P, and it is his purpose. Um, now, let, let me again say it was not God's purpose to take Cameron's life at 21 years old, but it, God does have a purpose for the grief that we are experiencing. And I can share with you unequivocally from the word of God what that is. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 4, God comforts us all in all our troubles so that we can comfort others with the same comfort we received from God. Hey, hey, come here a minute, come here a minute. I asked earlier, how many of you have suffered some major pain in your life or some major disappointment? How many of you are suffering some grief in your life right now? Let, 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 let me help you because the greatest ministry that you will ever have in this life will be born from the greatest pain that you've ever experienced in this life. And we're not gonna get over it, we're just gonna get through it. In the meantime, God says, I have a purpose for that pain. I have a purpose for that grief. I wanna use it to touch and bless others. You see, the world is not impressed by our prosperity. The world is impressed by how we handle adversity. Um, let me get real personal for just a minute and then I'll close the service. I want to talk to you a minute about how God is using our adversity to bless and touch others. We have a little 10 second or so TikTok. Many of you probably have seen that little TikTok that was uh, created by my granddaughter. Over seven and a half million people 
yes, seven and a half million times that little TikTok has been viewed. Over 5,000 people have taken the time to make a comment about it. And if you go read those comments, here's some of the stuff that you're going to read. I'm also addicted to drugs, but this video has shown me the pain that it is causing others, and I'm praying to God that it's going to help me be delivered. It's touching people's lives everywhere. We, we heard just two or three days ago about a young lady who had refused to acknowledge that she had an addiction uh, that was out of control in her life. And because, she says, because of Cameron's death, she says, I acknowledge that I have a problem. And she's now enrolled in a drug rehabilitation center. There's a nationally known artist who now lives in Black Mountain who has a picture of our grandson. She also had a son, 32 years old, that died from an overdose. And her whole life's mission now is to bring awareness about the dangers of drug addiction and the disease. She's taken Cameron's photograph along with many, many others. And she's drawing a portrait of him. And it's gonna be on display in Asheville the latter part of October and the first of November along with some others already made the news already many are being touched by it as well and it'll sweep across this country from one major city to another major city to another major city God is already using our adversity to those of you who are hurting going through pain and difficulty job loss, health problems, marital issues, the death of a loved one, whatever's caused your grief, I can tell you, you're not alone. God is with you. The body of Christ is around you. You may never get over it, but we'll get through it by the grace of God together. Would you stand with me, please? Heads are bowed and eyes are closed for just a minute. How many of you um, would just really be honest with yourself and honest with the Lord and honest with me for just a minute? How many of you would slip your hand up high enough and say, Pastor, my heart is so heavy and I'm in a lot of pain and I'm suffering grief right now. And you don't have to identify what caused it, but how many of you right now would say, Pastor, would you pray for me? I, I'm, I've got that grief stuff going on right now. Hands are going up all over the building, all over the building in the balcony as well. Everywhere across this facility, people have got their hands up. Father God, I just come before you just now thanking you that God we are not alone you're here with us you're closer you said that you would draw near to the broken hearted and those that are crushed in spirit and so we're asking you right now to draw more near than you've ever been to us as we seek to draw near to you God I pray for those that have had marriage breakups. I pray for those that have lost their job. Maybe a broken relationship. Maybe the loss of a loved one. God, I lift all these needs up to you. Every hand that went up, I bring them to the foot of your grace. Would you pour out on them right now everything that they need, Lord, to let them know that you are near, to let them know they're not alone, to let them know that you're going to enable them to get through 
I pray that you would bring peace right now. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fpcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.